And one of our favorite guests, Richard Sauter. For more than 17 years, Richard has been investigating, researching huge underground bases. His latest work, Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X-Files. And we'll be talking with Richard about that in just a moment on Coast to Coast Day. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Beginning way back, early childhood, Richard Sauter experienced firsthand contact with a variety of strange, unusual paranormal phenomena that left him a bit puzzled, thoroughly persuaded that there's so much more to planet Earth and to human perception and consciousness than what the mainstream is trying to tell us or not tell us. Some of Richard's favorite research and reading interests are underwater bases and tunnels, electronic mind control, freedom technology, human prehistory, remote antiquity, the Kundalini energy, and alternative thought patterns. He's with us now. He's got his latest workout hidden in plain sight beyond the X-Files. Richard, I've been looking forward to this. How are you? You know, I'm fine, George. How are you? Good, good. It's good to have you back, too. Thank you. This uh, this has been quite an undertaking, this latest work. And I, I wanted to get into the interest in some of these secret underground bases and how you began to investigate them. How did that happen for you? Well, you know, uh, I've always had a kind of a nose for uh, strange and anomalous information. So um, when I was a kid in in my teens, uh, one of my uncles knew about uh, the construction of Mount Weather in the uh, Mm -hmm. mid-Appalachians. This is about an hour's drive west of Washington, D.C. And uh, I have a lot of family in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, So he had some knowledge of that. I remember him mentioning that when I was a teenager, uh, and it interested me, <clears throat> but not until moving out to the Southwest in the late 1980s did I uh, really, uh, uh, for the first time, hear stories about secret underground um, bases and installations, and that really caught my interest, the more so since uh, the stories I heard, heard alleged that there were um, not only uh, clandestine um, government facilities, but that there were uh, purported extraterrestrial beings working and living in these facilities along with uh, clandestine uh, uh, government projects. So uh, that was the first time I ran across that kind of information, and um, I've looked into into it in some depth now. And you know what, George? I think there could just be a lot of truth to those stories. Uh, I think so, too. Now, subsequently to some of your research, Richard, have you discovered um, that the underground bases are are strictly government, or could they have been also uh, UFO-type underground bases? Have you been able to, uh, to convince yourself what they might be? Yes. Well, I think uh, both and. Uh, and uh, I would also say when you talk about uh, the government that both civil government agencies and military government agencies would be present underground. It's not strictly a military presence, though there certainly are a good number of underground military facilities. And I've also been led to understand there are a good number of undersea military facilities. But in addition to civil and military government agencies, there are Fortune 500 companies, or rather Fortune 1000 companies, Uh, some religious organizations have underground installations. The Mormons have a pretty good-sized one, sophisticated one, outside of Salt Lake City in the Wasatch Mountains. The um, the, the Scientologists have some underground facilities. Of course, the Vatican has a very well-known secret vault beneath Vatican City in Rome. Uh, where a lot of information has been stored literally over a couple thousand years. And then um, there are other organizations such as um, uh, multilateral institutions. Um, NATO, for example, would have underground facilities. When you think about the facility in Norway, where a variety of agencies and governments are sto- have established a uh, seed bank, to yeah. preserve uh, seed varieties from a very wide, variety, uh, v- very wide number of of plants, um, in the event of global catastrophe or cataclysm, the idea is that agriculture could be jump started again using 
these seeds. And by the way, it's not the only facility where that is done. It just happens to be perhaps the most uh, high-profile one. And, so and it's a pretty good idea, Richard, I think. Don't well, you? yes, it is. Um, in fact, if you look at um, the legends from peoples all over the planet, uh, it's clear that there have been repeated um, episodic bouts of cataclysm on this planet yeah. at intervals of thousands of years, uh, anywhere from three to 20,000 years, evidently. And anything from massive tsunamis to uh, pole shifts, if you believe the work of Charles Hapgood, and I'm willing to um, attach some credence to his work, uh, at times, evidently, the crust of the planet goes walkabout over the mantle and slips uh, sometimes maybe a couple of 3,000 miles at a time. And, of course, that will create quite a lot of upheaval, including climate change, which would certainly be disruptive to agriculture. So, yeah, uh, from the standpoint of making sure that agriculture can continue, um, it is very wise to do that. And um, that's not the only facility like that. There are quite a number of them around the planet. Which is probably smart, too, to keep them geographically scattered all over the place. Yes. You know, if um, I, I think you've had uh, Cliff High on the program before. Yeah. He'll be on the program later this week. Of course, Cliff's um, Internet uh, web bot analyses indicate that we may have another such episode occurring in the near future. Of course... Oh the future is plastic, and you never know what's going to happen unless and until it does. But if, for people who may have read some of his reports, there are some indications that that may happen. You could ask him more about that. Um, and certainly there have been other people speaking about that possibility as well. Cliff is not alone in, in that. Um, in fact, a lot of people have been having dreams and visions uh, in that vein, George, and uh, including yours truly. So um, it does appear that it's a possibility and that the human, um, uh, quite a number of humans are picking up on it. It's as if it's out there in the stuff of the racial uh, subconscious or unconscious, and we pick up on it in the dream or visionary state. And I would guess if they're building seed banks for seeds, these tunnels must be for the folks they want to keep uh, behind, huh? Well, yeah, and see, that raises a real question. If, See, I'm inclined to believe, and I was asked this by another reviewer, this is what you're alluding to um, in a roundabout way, uh, and, and that is I believe that the people should be told, George, if there's going to be cataclysm upcoming and the federal alphabet soup and other agencies around the world know that there is an excellent chance that this is going to happen, I really believe that people should be informed uh, I'm not an elitist at heart, um, and I'm wary of those who are. I believe that um, those who take lavish our money on themselves so that they can make extensive, expensive, and sophisticated preparations for their survival in the event that bad things happen to the planet mm -hmm while making no provision for the survival of others and not even informing others of what is about to come down. Um, in my view, that is not only unethical, it is borderline evil. Uh, I agree with you, Richard. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, I, I reviewed the movie 2012 this weekend on DVD. Yes. And, and it's got that kind of theory to it where... Yes, it does. They hid this for years from people. And yes, it does. And, you know, um, I mentioned at one, one point in my new book a conversation I had with one of the experts that um, I've consulted and interviewed and ha had lengthy discussions with over the past 17 years. Um, and I asked this one uh, expert about some of the reasons for creating underground bases of the clandestine variety. And, of course, I think many people are familiar with the idea that there are military command control and communication facilities such as Cheyenne Mountain and Site R sure. on the East Coast. But there's so many more you see, and many of them are, are very clandestine. Those are publicly known. There are many others that are not. Um, 
So I, I was asking about the reasons for these, and don't you know uh, some of the reasons that were given included such things as a pole shift, a change in the geophysics of the Earth's um, rotation, um, uh, sudden climate change, that kind of thing. In other words, the so-called ruling elite, the technocratic elite, uh, the uh, extremely plugged-in insider engineers who work on these kinds of projects are well aware these types of uh, events have come to pass in remote antiquity, and they're well aware that it's entirely possible these things will happen again. Moreover, George, it appears that they uh, strongly believe that some of these things may be happening in the very near future, and they are making extensive, and I would underscore that, extensive, extremely expensive and technologically very sophisticated preparations for these eventualities. And I believe that people should be told they're using our nickels to do it. How they're many trading. bases, Richard? How many? You well, you see, that's an excellent question. And it, the answer is a little complex. I will preface my remarks by saying there are many of them. Let me give you, for example, and by many I mean m minimally scores and perhaps hundreds in this country alone. And this would be of the clandestine variety. Um, and I, 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 I list in my book, um, you know, more than a score in the first part of the book of of uh, major underground facilities are known, that are known to me through my research that I can just reel off off the top of my head. But beyond that, there are certainly scores more. Um, there was a book uh, written by a man named Bill Gawley entitled Breaking Cover. Bill Gawley worked in the um, White House uh, military office in the White House uh, for years. I believe he began working there in the Eisenhower years and continued right up into the first part of the Carter presidency. So he saw um, quite a bit of what happened in the Oval Office, and he was heavily involved in it. Now, the military office is an office that liaises between the Pentagon and the executive office of the president, which is to say uh, the White House. And the military office essentially is uh, <clears throat> makes available to the president, any president, a slush fund of money that he can use at his discretion for projects that he deems important. Uh, this is essentially black budget activity. Now, what Dogola says is that already starting back in the 1950s, in the Eisenhower years, uh, the military office was heavily involved in building a, um, a suite, a whole series of 75 uh, secure underground facilities for use of the president. Uh, and that was already in the 50s, you see. Yeah. So they started out with 75 secret underground facilities then, and that, that was half a, more than half a century ago. And in the intervening years, my research shows quite clearly that uh, far from uh, building those and stopping, they have kept on ever since with a massive underground construction effort. Um, so I would say I'd be willing to say conservatively, conservatively, a hundred of the clandestine variety, and actually I'm inclined to believe there are far more than that. Now, one of my sources, when I asked him, I asked him how many uh, clandestine underground facilities are there, and he point blank told me there are many underground bases and thousands of people work in them. Um, that's straight from the horse's mouth. Now, um, I went on to speak with him more, and uh, one of the things he told me that fascinated me was that there are entire cutting-edge, really science fiction-like um, factories underground in some of these facilities. There are vast industrial production facilities that can essentially manufacture virtually anything from scratch. Uh, say they needed to make a, a microwave oven. <clears throat> Everything exists underground in these facilities, and there are multiple such facilities in the United States alone, deeply buried. They're large and extremely high-tech. They would actually make the glass 
or they could make the glass that they needed for the little pane in the front of the microwave. They could, uh, um, they have foundries uh, down there where they could make the metal and roll out the aluminum. They could, they could make the electronic and electrical components from scratch. They have all of the tools and machinery for that. If they needed to make an automobile, they could create an automobile from scratch, making the tires and everything, and and so forth. Um, this is this is virtually like something out of a science fiction movie, and yet there are multiple such facilities, and that's all only what I was told about in a casual conversation over the telephone. And I'm sure the Russians have them, like you said, the Vatican has one, maybe more. So it's all over the all over the planet. Well, yes, there are many all over the all over the world. For example, in the run up to the um, Gulf War, um, which George Bush um, conducted against the regime of Saddam Hussein, George Bush the father, George Bush pair, um, the Bechtel Corporation, which is sometimes called a you know, part of the shadow government because sure. it it plays such a huge role in the uh, working of the military industrial yeah. espionage complex. And they they built half of Saudi Arabia, didn't they? Uh, they did a lot, and all, all over the world, Bechtel uh, is, has operations that are global in scope, but they're certainly very active in the United States as well. But they do quite a lot of work for the American government, and, and a lot of it is black budget type of operations. Well, they went into Saudi Arabia in the 1980s and built a series of five very deeply buried, very technologically sophisticated underground bases out in the desert in preparation for the Gulf War. People need to understand that wars don't just happen. They are arranged and planned many years in advance. Among yes. other things, wars are big business for the Fortune 500 uh, corporations. They make billions and even trillions of dollars off of warfare. And so for them uh, to lay the groundwork for a major war is a, a business undertaking. It's just business for them, the business of industrial slaughter, otherwise known as war. And they're very cynical and cold about it. Now, they will trot out propaganda for the public about liberty and freedom and democracy and so forth. The bottom line is war is big business, and that's what you need to understand first and foremost. And so Bechtel got huge uh, contracts uh, to go in and build those huge underground facilities in Saudi Arabia. I could document five from the open literature. And in fact, uh, Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf who was blustering all over TV and radio during the conduct of that war, um, did his fighting from deep underground. It's easy to be brave when you're a couple thousand feet underground, George. Yeah, it is. Not, and I was going to ask you, how big and how deep? A couple hundred, a couple thousand feet. Oh, easily. Um, I don't know exactly how deep those particular facilities are. I just know that they're, uh, they're deep. Um, my guess would be at least several hundred feet, if not a couple thousand feet. Now, what I do know and have been told explicitly and have also documented from the literature that I've seen um, is that it's child's play to make a base, a large base, uh, one mile underground. Um, that's state of the art and has been for decades, really. That is uh, just amazing. And I, I bet they go in almost with a slant type of drilling, you know. Well, there are different when, ways to do it. Yeah. You can go in, you can go in, and I've seen uh, schematic diagrams of various um, ways of doing it in the in the military and civil engineering literature and, and other government documents that I've looked at. You can access facilities by vertical shafts, and they can be quite deep. I mean, even in the open, open mining literature, they can well, make... You vertical know, shafts two miles deep, George. You know, Richard, they've got underground uh, tunnels, for example, underwater, so they can do incredible things. Let's talk more about that, and maybe you can describe what they look like inside. More with Richard Sauter on Coast to Coast AM. You see, we're in our underground cavern, too. <laughs> we'll be back with Richard Sauter in just a moment as we talk about hidden in plain sight 
Beyond the X-Files on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. We're with Richard Sauter tonight. Fascinating information. So, R- Richard, let's go back and talk about what they may look like, these facilities, and um, your thoughts again on how they construct them. Well, uh, what they look like depends on um, the, the function. Uh, some of them can be quite large. I was, I've been told uh, that some of them are actually vast. Um, and speaking with one uh, specialist about the uh, Monsanto complex in New Mexico, um, I, I asked about uh, the dimensions of it, and the response was vast. I also was told about it uh, by a woman who wrote to me, wrote to me, and was a re- recipient of a deathbed confession from her elderly father who had gone away from the family for some period of time when she was younger. All they knew was that he was working on a construction job in New Mexico, and not until he was about to die did he tell her that he had helped to build a what he called an underground city, not a base, not a facility, but a, an actual city, city underground in New Mexico. And this was back in the 1950s. So they can be quite large, um, and actually some of the technology he described to her that they installed all, already back in the 1950s would be technology that even today many people would not have in their homes. So you have to understand that in the black world, um, there's technology that would be in these facilities uh, that would be quite a lot different from what you would know uh, from your everyday life. Um, so not only can they be, uh, the, the, the dimensions can be quite large inside, uh, there can be cavernous chambers, um, but also the technology uh, with which these things are equipped and outfitted is, you know, uh, really a technical quantum leap beyond what we have to use in our everyday lives. It's been held back from us, in other words. We, we're paying for it. Um, it's being built with our money, but without our knowledge, and we don't have access to these things. We really have um, a, at least a two-tier um, society. We have what's going on in the black world, vastly funded, very technologically sophisticated, and then we have what's happening in our world, so to speak, which is much less well-funded and which is not nearly so uh, technologically sophisticated. In fact, uh, the infrastructure that we're dealing with is in a state of uh, decline. Yeah, yeah I, I can believe that. And, uh... Well, I can see it. As you drive around and you look at what's happening, you can see crumbling bridges and streets. You see a rickety rail system. You see an electrical uh, a grid that is struggling to meet with uh, you know, supply demand. Sure. And, and on and on. Meanwhile, we have literally trillions of dollars being sucked out of the budget for stimulus bills, uh, bailout bills. We had the spectacle of the um, Federal Reserve's uh, um, chief financial officer uh, testifying before Congress and being questioned by Representative Alan Grayson from Florida, and she had the cheek to tell him she could not account for the disposition of something on the order of $2 trillion, which ostensibly fall under her purview. So we are just being, we're being mugged, George. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And it's uh, not a small mugging. Uh, It's not like being held up at gunpoint and someone takes lists a hundred bucks. We're being mugged by the trillions of dollars. And each individual is actually having uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars stolen from him and from her. Now, b- beyond the bases for military purposes, uh, you know, to be able to control command and control, I can understand yeah. that. What are they using these facilities for? What are they expecting, Richard? Well, you see, that's the question, and that's what, what really bothers me and, and, and other researchers, too, the gr- great secrecy that surrounds so much of this. Um, one of the things we know, for example, the NSA has 
vast acres and acres and acres of supercomputers underground, which they use for surveillance purposes. Now, um, I mean Big Brother George Orwell style surveillance purposes. I uh, I object to that. I don't think that has any role in a free society. Um, it does in dictatorship, uh, but not in a free society. So that alone is an indication that we are now living under dictatorship, the technocratic mm -hmm. uh, dictatorship. That's one example of some of the things that uh, go on underground. Another example might be um, secretive biological engineering and genetic engineering. There are many, a uh, fair number of anecdotal accounts of this kind of thing happening underground, and that, again, is troubling because... If the human genome is being tinkered with, if there's secret human cloning research going on underground, if there is secret um, uh, uh, bacteriological warfare research going on underground, frankly, that's our business. It's our planet, and it's our welfare that is at stake and at question, and we absolutely deserve to know about it, the more so, since we're paying for it. Um, that's another example. Then there are uh, many stories, of course, of, of um, underground facilities and also some stories of undersea facilities with an alien presence. And by the way, the aliens need not always be non-human. Evidently, some of them are very human. And it would appear that one of the big secrets behind the ET and UFO cover-up is that, oh, by the way, not all of the ETs are non-human. Some of them are fully human, and it would appear that one of the big aspects of the cover-up is that the Earth may not be the only planet in the galaxy with a resident human population. That's an incredible story. Yes, and it's, it's a story that I think um, uh, a fair number of researchers are beginning to suspect is the truth. Um, I'm one of them. Now, there are other things that have come my way. I've been told um, that uh, some of these facilities can be secret mining facilities. Imagine if you have your own secret gold mine or uranium mine or platinum mine, and you're able to mine this and have your own stash of precious metals. Mm -hmm. um, that could be very valuable, especially if you are a government agency and you can move this on the black market to raise funding for other clandestine operations. Sounds like somebody's being King Solomon all over again, huh? Yeah, it could be. Um, I'll give you one for in instance of that that I, I was related to me anecdotally, and that was during the uh, construction of this of the facility, the so-called Monsanto underground base in New Mexico, um, I was told that, of course, there are uh, there, there are veins of gold in the Rocky Mountains in general, and certainly in the mountains in New Mexico. And during the construction of this vet, of this uh, base, from time to time, the miners ran across uh, veins of gold. In some cases, they were pretty good veins of gold. The ore was of a very high quality, and the generals that were running the project confiscated that gold for their own and self-enrichment. So that's one example. That w was then a twofer. <laughs> at one and the same time, they made a base that at that time was pretty secret. Uh, not so much today, but at that time, yes. But, but in the process of, of, of building the base, they were also running their own uh, clandestine gold mining operation. Richard, do you think these mines, once they're built, are, are, are manned and there's a whole bunch of people down in, in each one of them, or do they kind of yeah. leave until they have to go back down there and use it? No, no. a lot of these would have a resident workforce, um, you know, round the clock. M many of them are fully staffed all the time. Um, it's hard to know uh, just how many because uh, there's such a high degree of compartmentalization. The agencies involved, whether they're government organizations or non-governmental, are, are in the main very secretive. I would go further and say extremely secretive about what they're doing underground. There's another issue I want to mention, and that is for years we've had a tremendous problem in the society of missing persons. Yes. Uh, I mean, a 
very large number of missing persons. Thousands and thousands every year. It's it's just a, a vast number. Yeah. And you can account for a certain number of them in terms of runaway children, uh, husbands who are um, nag, nagged one too many times and hit the road, etc. But beyond that, you're left with a large number of people that simply cannot be accounted for at the end of each year. Uh, nationwide, it's quite large. I think it actually runs over 100,000 people a year who, who just fall through the cracks and vanish. Where do they go? What happens to them? Um, I am beginning to wonder if some of them um, may not be taken underground as guinea pigs or uh, uh, forced labor, um, source of forced labor, or, or for other reasons. Um, I think you've had Melinda Leslie on the program yeah. a time or two or more, and she certainly has um, talked to a number of people who have been abducted by the United States military. So there's a, a growing body of anecdotal evidence that that points to the United States military running its own clandestine human abduction program for for very obscure purposes. But part of this do, do, does entail taking people underground to these very bizarre underground facil facilities where the military is doing, frankly, weird things. And... They're also, in some cases, aliens down there. Now, of course, we hear these stories from the ones who are abducted and come back, who live to tell the tale. What about the ones who may be abducted and don't return? And there could be many of those, too, then, Richard, as you were saying. Uh, there yeah. could be many. And it appears that, you know, in theory, the mil military is here to serve and defend, but in practice... Um, researchers have found many, many disturbing military programs that, frankly, have preyed on the ver have been predatory against the very population that they have sworn to um, keep safe and to defend from harm. One would think that these uh, these cover these bases these these tunnels would be in uh, you know areas. Uh, of not too populated uh, spots in this country, but a lot of them are are under major cities, aren't they? Well, well you know that's right, and 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 that's uh, an important issue. Um, I I want to make clear for people that in fact um, there are are a good number of, of bases in relatively unpopulated areas, in mountainous areas or desertous areas, and and the technology exists to create. Uh, vast underground and undersea bases literally anywhere on the planet and at great depth. However, as you observe, it's true that these facilities uh, can be and are also located um, under major metropolitan areas, including cities such as Moscow, uh, London, uh, Beijing, New York, Washington, D.C., etc. And in some cases, the tunneling under these cities has been going on for millennia. In the case well, of people of hear Paris hums, Rome, pa pardon me. People hear hums, for example. Uh, could that be the building of these these uh, bases? <laughs> I'll go you one better than that. I was recently speaking with a couple of uh, uh, naval intelligence officers and. Um, they were telling me that um, during the Soviet period, when, uh, as you know, there was a lot of surveillance of, of Soviet um, submarine maneuvers and vice versa on their part. But, of course, they were tasked with monitoring um, the uh, maneuvers of Soviet submarines in the open sea. And they were constantly detecting um, drilling, large drills. And when they asked their superiors about that, they were told, um, oh, it's drilling. And when uh -huh. they asked what kind of drilling, uh, they were given ev evasive answers but were led to believe it was petroleum. And I pointed out to these guys that using their own Navy's doc the Navy's own documentation going back to the mid-'60s already and coming forward from that point, um, 
the Navy had, the United States Navy had an active R&D program for creating massive uh, manned, permanently manned uh, bases down in the bedrock beneath the seafloor in an open uh, mid-ocean environment. I mean, hundreds of miles offshore, way offshore, and thousands of feet of water. So the technology that's described in the Navy documentation, which, by the way, is not classified, plainly states that a, a technology from the petroleum, offshore petroleum industry, can be used in the construction of manned undersea bases in the deep sea environment. So I pointed this out to them and said, yeah, yeah, I don't doubt that you were here, here drilling. By the way, it could have been the United States Navy or aliens or the Russians or who knows, uh, yeah. uh, making undersea bases. And one of the ways they do that is by drilling through the bedrock down beneath the seafloor. This is just remarkable. You know, I'd like to go down to one of these one day, Richard. <clears throat> well, you may. Um, yeah. I'll see if I can get us a pair of tickets, George. Yeah, yeah. You, they. I'm you, not sure they'd let you go. You bring the popcorn, and um, yeah. I'll finagle the tickets. Uh, absolutely. Now, you know, we talked about how the seed bank is a good idea. <clears throat> We've yeah. talked about how, for some military purposes, it's probably a very smart idea to have. Well, that's these presuming. That's presuming that the military policy is sane. And I have True. to say exactly. I have to say that more and more I don't I I don't presume sanity on the part of military planners. And you know the old saw about uh military intelligence is that it's supposed to be a contradiction in terms. But if for some reason this pop this this planet is going to get hit, let's say, by an asteroid or, yes. or some kind of missile attack. Yeah. Is it a, is it a, is it a smart idea to preserve a portion of humanity in these underground? Yeah, yeah it is. I, w w what I object to is the non-egalitarian manner in which it's being done. If, for example, uh, NASA or other agencies know that the Earth is going to be shotgunned by asteroids, say five years from now, suppose the NSA, with its deep space sentry um, probes, which uh, I've been led to understand are, are out in the vicinity of Pluto and, ne Pluto and Neptune, way out on the fringes of the solar system. Suppose they detect um, a, a huge um, um, number of asteroids inbound to the inner solar system and assign you know, the probability of the Earth getting shotgunned by space rock somewhere in the neighborhood of 99.9%. You see, I believe the human race should be told under those circumstances, and I believe there should effectively be a global lottery. And we would select those who would go underground into the Noah's Arks, rather than, say, the uh, Council on Foreign Relations saying, oh, by the way, me and my wife and my children, we're going underground, and the rest of you suckers, good luck. I don't well, like that. I, I agree with you, but you know, like like 2012, what will probably happen is the wealthy will get the good seats. Oftentimes, that's the way it is, and I must say, I'm not in agreement. And and that would be one reason for the great secrecy in these facilities, because um, I've plainly been told that some of them are designed for that type of scenario, um, which means that at the highest levels, the so-called ruling elite are perfectly aware that that is um, a possibility, maybe even a probability over the next 10 or 20 years. All right, Richard, stay with us. We're already at the top of the hour, and uh, we are talking with Richard Sauter, his uh, remarkable new work, Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X-Files, as we talk about these very secret underground tunnels and bases. Soon we'll go in underwater and find out what's there, too. I'm George Norrie, back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And our guest tonight is Richard Sauter as we talk about his latest work, Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X-Files. We'll be back with Richard in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Do you think, uh, truly think, Richard, it's uh, going to be around the five-year period before we're uh, going to be using these underground facilities? I really don't know. Um, I do know that um, the planet is in a period of transition. 
we've had some serious earthquakes already this year, and it looks like there may be some more. In fact, I don't know whether in the event of true cataclysm, say perhaps uh, uh, slippage of the crust on the mantle, um, whether it would matter if you were in an underground facility or not. I, I, I can see that under those conditions, um, there would be such chaos and cataclysm that um, it would be pretty much a crapshoot wherever you yeah. were as to whether you would survive physically. It, it's got to be something they know is coming from above, because I agree with you. You know, the, if, if we had an earthquake like the one that hit near uh, Chile, uh, I mean, that, that would devastate, I think, any kind of underground cavern. Well, it, it depends. Um, if the facility is right on a fault, if it's bisected by a fault, yes. However, if it's not, then perhaps that would not be the case. I, I, did, I did see, when I was doing my research, some indications that a well-designed facility and a competent body of rock uh, might actually fare better than a structure on the surface because of the way that seismic waves move through the rock. Uh, when they come to an empty place, they are greatly attenuated because um, they really can't be transmitted to any meaningful degree through the air, only through the rock. So when they get to the underground facility, because it's empty, it's an excavated space, um, the way the uh, seismic waves don't really cause or have the same effect that they would on the surface necessarily. So it depends on how um, well designed and built the facility is. It also depends exactly where it's located. And I believe that the geological engineers who design and consult on the construction of these facilities would keep all of that in mind. So maybe in a well designed and well situated underground facility, you might actually fare as well or better than you would on the surface. Do you think there would be planetary-wide panic if they said today, folks, a huge asteroid is coming to this planet, it will hit in the next three years, it can wipe out civilization the way we know it right now? What do you, th what do you think would happen? Oh, there'd be a lot of unrest, there'd be a lot of disquiet, there's no, no doubt However, that would also be the case when and if it hits. Um, so if the intent was to uh, spare the public pain, um, I think the preferred course of action, were I in a position um, to influence uh, public policy, would be to tell people in the best way possible. But yes, I would always be inclined to think that the public should be informed. It's our planet, and I think that we uh, have a right to know what's happening on the planet. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Jim Mars, you know Jim. He is uh, written... Yes, I know Jim. He was, he's written about the uh, our government now being the Fourth Reich. How does yes. this fit into, if it does, the secret underground bases in this program? Yeah, I'm familiar with that thesis of... of uh, Gems, and I uh, have to say that I find some support for that line of thought in my own research. It's a fact that um, at the close of World War II, a very large number of Nazis were brought to this country to continue uh, their work for um, the American regime just as they had worked for the Nazi regime, with the difference that instead of saluting the swastika, they, they, they commenced saluting the, you know, the stars and stripes. But they were carrying out the same work, the same research, developing the same technologies. Instead of working for the um, Nazi military, they worked for the American military. Um, and in fact, when I went to the NASA archives, um, researching not underground bases, but something else entirely, I did run across a couple of Project Paperclip, declassified Project Paperclip uh, memoranda, which I reproduce in my latest book. The thing I found interesting about those 
two particular uh, memos was that they specifically requested four German technicians by name to come to the United States and to work on the American military's so-called underground plant program. This was circa 1947. One of the men whom was named is or was Xaver Dorsch. Now, he wasn't just any Joe Schmo who fell off a turnip truck. He was then perhaps the preeminent expert on underground construction, underground base construction. <clears throat> During uh, the Third Reich, there was an agency called the Tote Organization, founded by a German engineer named Fritz Tote. And really, he was an engineering genius. He uh, was the father of the German Autobahn system. When uh, war broke out, um, or was instigated, as you as, as you like, um, Adolf Hitler asked Fritz Tote to create an organization, that, uh, an, a civil engineering organization that would support the German military, which he did, and, and it was named after him, the Tote Organization. Fritz Tote was killed in a plane crash in 1942, and control of much of the organization's activities effectively passed to Xaver Dorsch, who was also quite a gifted civil engineer. Xaver Dorsch initially reported to Albert Speer, but as the war progressed, Hitler removed uh, Dorsch from under Speer's command and had uh, Xaver Dorsch report directly to him, Adolf Hitler. What Hitler wanted uh, Dorsch to do was to create, in addition to the many other structures that the Tote organization was building uh, for the German military, was to create a series of uh, deep underground um, industrial production plants, which Dorsch began to do, but of course the end of the war uh, cut those plants short. He was taken into captivity by the American military and detained in uh, one of their prisoner of war facilities. Now, while in American military captivity, he um, produced at least two um, documents during the course of his debriefing, which I have. There are others. Uh, there's at least one other I couldn't get, and I believe there m must certainly be others that are classified to this day. Now, in this document that I have, the Project Paperclip memos, they ask spe specifically to bring Salvador to the United States to work on the military's so-called underground plant program. I don't know if he came. I rather suspect he did, because most every German that Project Paperclip wanted, Project Paperclip got, and he was in American military custody. So I think it would have been pretty simple for them to bring him to the United States, um, he did. He did have a civil engineering career in Germany after the war. However, he founded a firm in 1952, so there was a period of approximately seven years where he would have been available to the Americans, and I rather suspect that he was consulting for them during that period. Do you think any of these bases might be connected, Richard, in terms of t uh, tunnels? Uh, with rail lines or anything like that? Yeah, I do. I, I think that's very possible. In fact, there was another Nazi engineer. Um, well, I shouldn't say Nazi because I don't know if he was actually a card-carrying Nazi. But there was another German engineer who was working uh, during the Third Reich by the name of Hermann Kemper. And he was working on a concept uh, that he called the Rohrbahn. He carried out R&D on that during the 1930s and even during the 40s during World War II, and the research continued after World War II. And in fact, today the Germans are, are among the world leaders in magnetic levitation train uh, um, technology, so-called maglev technology. And Hermann Kemper's Rohrbahn, Rohrbahn, even in the 1930s, was designed to go... 1,800 miles per hour underground. That's 1,800 miles per hour underground, riding on a magnetic field and zooming through a, an underground tunnel from which most of the air has been evacuated such that you have a partial vacuum. 
and thus you would have very little wind resistance and very little friction. And because the train would ride on a magnetic field, you wouldn't have friction from wheels and rails either. So it could indeed zip along very fast. So that was his scheme. <clears throat> um, that research has been continued down through the years um, after World War II in about 1949. Robert Goddard, the father of American rocketry, and really of chemical rocketry in general, who, by the way, did some of his best work in Roswell, New Mexico during the 1930s. Um, anyway, Goddard had a patent in 1949 in which he, he had a, a, a design similar in many respects to, to that of, of Hermann Kemper. But Robert Goddard's uh, train was designed to go coast to coast in North America in 10 minutes. In other words, 10 at about, minutes? Wow. Yes, at, at about 15,000 miles per hour underground. Uh, now, that work was also extended by an engineer named Robert Salter for the RAND Corporation. He produced a study for the RAND Corporation in the 1970s with a scheme very similar to that of Hermann Kemper and Robert Goddard. In Salter's um, scheme, you would have, again, uh, a maglev train, very high-speed maglev train going at speeds in the 14,000 and 15,000 mile per hour range. However, Salter, uh, in, in Salter's scheme, there's provision made for intermediate stops mid-continent. So he would take as much as, say, 50 or 55 minutes to go coast to coast. That's going to happen if it uh, isn't well, you really see, it going to may already. It may already have been done. Yeah. And I say that because... Um, Starting about in the mid-60s and continuing through the 70s and right down to the late 70s and, and maybe around 1980 or so, there was in this country something called the High Speed Ground Transportation Initiative. This was a multi-agency um, R&D effort involving uh, some military agencies from the Navy and Army, for example, but also from other government agencies such as the Department of Transportation. And um, then you had some of the railroads involved, uh, major corporations like GE and Westinghouse, I believe, were involved. Then you also had uh, some of the nation's uh, premier engineering schools, mining engineering and also other engineering schools who were involved in the design uh, R&D of an underground, very high-speed um, tube-train tunnel network. Now, this research was carried out actively over a period of years, and um, this multi-agency, um, approximately 15-year effort, produced a pile of studies, articles, <clears throat> designs, memos, etc., uh, many of which I have collected in the course of my research. And it all went away in about the early 1980s, late 70s, early 1980s. Not too long after that, we started hearing rumors about secret underground tunnel systems with high-speed trains zooming through them. And we started hearing homes around this country. Yeah, um, all of which causes me to think... Um, that there probably are secret underground high-speed um, trains. There are certainly people who say that there are. Um, I'm inclined to give them a hearing. Let's, let's talk for a moment, Richard, if we can, about some of the undersea bases, and then at the break we'll get into uh, what could be extraterrestrial or alien bases and see if there's yes. a working yes. relationship here. Now, these undersea bases fascinate me. Are, yes. are these bases that you have to get to them via submarine, or is there another way to enter and get into them? Well, my research shows that there would be at least three ways, uh, and maybe more if there were exotic technologies involved. One of the most prosaic ways to enter an undersea base would be via a vertical shaft on an island, say like Bermuda or the Hawaiian Islands or something like that, 
and go down, say, a mile or two or three through a vertical shaft, and once at depth, go out under the sea through a more or less horizontal tunnel and access undersea bases that way. In, in theory and in practice, there's nothing to exclude such tunnels for extending for hundreds of miles, the more so if you have high-speed trains zooming through them. So that's one way. Another way is to actually extend tunnels out under the seabed from onshore. And again, here, yeah. the tunnels could even be hundreds of miles long. There's another way to do it, and that is to put airlocks right on the seafloor and to get access to an undersea base that way. Um, all of these means of accessing undersea bases are openly discussed in the open literature that I've examined. Um, now, if you did have submarine access, um, it's state-of-the-art for the United States Navy, and I'm sure for other navies as well, to mate to hatches uh, for airlocks in an, a deep-sea environment. So that certainly would be a way to transfer not only personnel, but supplies and equipment. Um, I believe that's happening. The circumstantial evidence I have points in that direction, and I've had people tell me that there are um, undersea facilities. So at this point, I accept that they uh, must exist. Did you come across any research that shows that some of these undersea bases are um, at either at, uh, at the North Pole or the South Pole? Yeah, and you know, if you look at the illustrations in my book, um, there are some wonderful illustrations by a, a Navy illustrator who was attached to the Navy's R&D team at the China Lake Naval Ordnance Test Station in California back in the mid-1960s. His name is Walter Kirshner, and um, he, in fact, produced produced one um, uh, illustration that depicts uh, a submarine going through a subsea tunnel um, through a kind of a seamount, and that is clearly in a polar region because there's pack ice there um, on the surface of the sea. So uh, clearly the Navy had asked him or tasked him with depicting graphically certain scenario, scenarios related to undersea submarine tunnels as well as undersea bases. So, yeah, I think they're there and other places around the world as well, George. The picture that's come into focus for me is that we have been so massively lied to that, that we, you know, the members of the public don't really understand the full extent of the technology that's been developed with our money, without our knowledge. Right. And, and to our great detriment, we are fighting uh, ruinous wars right now over fossil fuel reserves in Asia. Meanwhile, technology is being held back from us that makes all of that superfluous. So the reason this is happening is just for war profiteering. End of discussion. Did the Nazis, after the war, um, besides coming here under the paperclip operation and what they may be doing, I had always heard that Hitler escaped in a submarine and made his way under the Antarctica. Yeah, I don't know if Hitler escaped or not. Um, he may have. I, I couldn't say one way or the other. Uh, but it is true the Nazis had an interest in the Antarctic, and in fact, they claimed part of the Antarctic territory for the Third Reich. So I wouldn't rule out that the Nazis may have ha had some kind of activities at the South Pole. Richard, stay with us. We're going to come back and talk about what the ETs might have. We'll be back. Okay, next hour, we'll open up the phone lines, give you an opportunity to talk with Richard Sauter about his uh, really remarkable work with Hidden in plain sight beyond the X-Files. We'll be back with them, though. I want to talk about the possibility of these ET underground bases. That's next on Coast to Coast AM. Richard, what did your work uncover? And I was going to say dig up, but as we talk about underground bases, maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> what did your work uncover 
about ETs and uh, the possibility of their bases? Well, they certainly seem to be down there. There are a fair number of people who, who report uh, being taken into underground facilities and in some cases undersea facilities where, where they interact with or see um, extraterrestrial or seeming, or seeming alien beings. So I accept that, that they're down there. Um, I might add that pe- people also report being abducted uh, by factions of the American military and taken underground into these facilities. So it's it's very bizarre. And there's these are criminal activities, by the way. If if if, if you are um, kidnapped, um, that used to be a capital crime. So I don't think it makes it all right for the military to stealthily abduct people. If you were to do that, you would be subject to incarceration in the penitentiary potentially for decades. So why is it okay if you have an American military uniform on to sneak around abducting people? And yet this is going on. These ET bases, are they being done with our cooperation? I think in some cases it looks like like, like that's what's happening. And it raises a host of questions for which I don't have ready answers. But the questions themselves trouble me, and I believe they tr- trouble many other people who think about these issues to an extent. Now, are there craft also underground? Or Yeah, uh... yeah I think so. And in fact, I um, have an illustration from Look Magazine from 1955 in my book. There was... Uh, um, an article that Look, Look Magazine came out with in 1955 pertaining to the uh, many flying saucer sightings that were being had, held, uh, being had around the country. And people were talking about this. It was a real topic of conversation back then. You may remember that, George. I was a kid then, but I remember that a lot of UFOs were seen where I lived in, in the Tidewater region of Virginia. So this Look Magazine article actually has a depiction of an underground flying saucer base with a camouflaged opening in a mountainous region, presumably of the United States. Now, the uh, thrust of the article is that this base would have been an American flying saucer base, but how strange that Look Magazine in the mid-1950s presumed that the American military was building or would soon build flying saucers and would have its own underground flying saucer base. There you have it. It's in the open literature, and I include that illustration in my book. And uh, Look Magazine was at the forefront of these reports during those days. I mean, yeah, I they had a that. lot of interesting articles. They they carried uh, Jackie Gleason's, some of Jackie Gleason's um, work on UFOs. He was pretty outsp- outspoken on the topic. Yeah, yeah, he was a believer. Well, he, and he claims that Richard Nixon showed him uh, a, a, an extraterrestrial uh, at Homestead uh, Base, uh, Air Base in uh, Florida. Yeah, you know, I've read that story, and I'm inclined to believe it. Why not? Because uh, a lot of people have come forth uh, in recent years alleging to have seen uh, a variety of of alien corpses under many different circumstances. So um, I can believe it. Ryan Wood has certainly demonstrated to my satisfaction that the American military has recovered many uh, crashed UFOs or in some cases some cases apparently shot them down, and that uh, presumably there would be corpses of whatever entities or beings were in the craft that they would also take possession of. So I really, at this point, don't have any trouble believing this type of story. What do you think these ETs are doing here? Why bases? Well, they would be underground and or undersea for the same reason that terrestrial humans would be. Uh, to conceal their activities for a level of security, uh, physical security, and uh, privacy. So that would be the reason. Um, It's not only, you know, we have uh, beings here that are being very stealthy, whether we're talking about terrestrial human factions in the military, in civil government, or in other agencies 
and organizations, and also uh, factions that evidently are com coming here from off the planet, and they all are behaving in a very stealthy, furtive, uh, furtive manner, which raises a lot of questions. What are they hiding? What's to hide? Absolutely. Tell us about the case of uh, abductee Krista Tilton. Well, you know, have you talked to Kristen, Krista yourself, George? I have not. Well, she was really more in circulation back in the 80s and I'd say early 90s. Um, I don't know if she really makes public appearances anymore, but she did for a while, and I talked with her a few times. Her story is that she was abducted and taken underground to a base that she believed was in northern New Mexico, uh, which she thought was the Dulce base. She doesn't know exactly where it was. But she was taken there by clandestine elements of the American military and also saw alien beings there and some weird genetic and biological type of um, research and experimentation, uh, ostensible cloning, uh, programs and that type of thing. Uh, the technology that she saw, the biological technology that she saw was frankly bizarre. And also the interaction between the military and the aliens and between her and the military was frankly also bizarre. Um, I think something very strange happened to Krista and I'm inclined to give her the benefit of the doubt because there are other people who have come forward with, if not precisely uh, the same story, at least stories that bear some resemblance to what she has reported. And it does appear that certain factions of the American military are involved with certain ET or alien factions underground, and it seems that they're up to no good. Why the lie, Richard? Why the big cover-up? I don't know, but the, the lying is epidemic. And it's not only the projects themselves, but it's the, the, the um, if you will, the social technology of compartmentalization that permits, uh, you know, the um, mass deception of society by concealing the activities of very large numbers of human beings in society. And, and this social technology, social technology, of compartmentalization is extremely advanced and widely used by the military industrial espionage complex. And there's also the question of the funding for these things. Uh, you've interviewed Catherine Austin Fitz. Yes, uh, all the time. Yes. She's quite knowledgeable about this, and there's no question that trillions of dollars have been sucked out of the federal budget and out of the economy in general. Been, it's been sucked out of our pockets, literally. This money's been taken from us, and it's been lavished on projects and programs about which we are told little or even nothing whatsoever. And I'm back to one of my main points. It's our money. We deserve to know. We ought to know. We should know. How do they cook the books? How do they hide the money? A lot of ways. Bill Gawley... In, in the book I mentioned at the outset of our interview, Breaking Cover, um, told how already back in the 50s and 60s, the, the American military uh, used what was essentially a shell game um, where they would um, funnel money uh, from the Army through uh, a little-known uh, engineering office in the Chesapeake Division of the Naval Engineers and um, according to him, it was so adroitly done that even a practiced accountant or a really um, <clears throat> eagle-eyed spy would have trouble tracing the money. They've only gotten better at it in the last half century, and the amounts of money involved now are just mind-boggling off the charts. Um, I've talked about this with Catherine Alston Fitz before, and she said to me, and I agree, that with the amount of money that's in play, this black budget money, which runs evidently into the multiple trillions of dollars, that with that amount of money, you can do anything, anything at all. You Probably make makes the TARP money look like loose change, Richard, doesn't it? It does. 
It does, because we're talking about trillions of dollars uh, by those standards. Uh, we are being mugged. The American people are being shook down. It's, it's frankly a very organized crime. It makes sense to speak of the United States government at this point as a criminal syndicate, as a massive global money laundering operation. Any records that you stumble across about any catastrophes that could have occurred during construction of these tunnels and these bases or anything like well, that? Well, I, I can tell you that, in general, construction work is dangerous work, and mining uh, is dangerous work. <clears throat> so I don't have any doubt that men would be killed constructing these projects. Um, but if it's a clandestine project, of course, there would not be an obituary in the local paper saying Joe Schmo was killed working on a top-secret compartmentalized program underground. Um, there would be a cover story to account for the death if it was publicly acknowledged at all. Richard, tell us a little bit about where you get this book. You put a lot of work into it, Hidden in Plain Sight. Yes, I have. I spent years working on this one. Um, I did devote more time to it than some of the others. <clears throat> and the best place to... Uh, get it is at keyholepublishing.com and the links are up on your website if people want to check that out they can click right through of course they can also get it at amazon.com as as you look at what has been going on the fact that we're not going to be told about it can we assume that if an event occurs let's use the old asteroid for lack of a better yes. Yeah. Is it going to be one of these things where it just hits us and then they tell us? Or they, you know, they run around and it's, uh, it's, it's panic mode? You know, I, I really don't know. But, but, but what's clear to me at this point is the United States government is a rogue regime. We, we see criminality on every hand, not only with the bailout bills and the TARP funds and stuttering um, you know, officers from the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve who come to Congress and just point-blank lie about the disposition of trillions of dollars under their control. Uh, um, it's, it's, the whole system is wildly out of control, and what we see is incompetence and criminality run amok right across the gamut of, of federal agencies from one end of, of the United States government to the other. It's a mess, George, and I think the American people understand this at this point. So. Go, no, ahead. go ahead. Who do you think is well, in charge, though, with all this? Well, well that's, that's the question, isn't it? We, we have a, a president who's transparently really good at reading teleprompters. So who writes all that stuff on the teleprompters? Um, beyond that question, who's really in charge at the Federal Reserve? Because we have officers of the Federal Reserve, whether it's Ben Bernanke or the chief financial officer, who will come before the Congress – and you read their remarks in the transcripts, and um, they're impenetrable. They're spouting nonsense. It's, it's just uh, indecipherable. It's, n it's not intelligible by a person of, of, you know, of a, of a uh, normal mentality. So who is in charge, and, and who actually writes this nonsense that's spouted whether by Ben Bernanke or uh, Barack Obama or Timothy Geithner or any of them, um, I have been told that there is another level higher up that um, someone like the president or United States senators or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Queen of England, say, or the Pope in the Vatican and so forth, these people have a degree of power in their sphere of, of action or of influence, uh, but that they, they, in a sense, are puppets for other power brokers that stay in the shadows, um, who run the so-called shadow government, and that there is a degree of global or international um, cooperation. There is not really any publicly known name for this organization I've heard it read to, referred to simply as the organization um, or the foundation in one case uh, one person refers to this shadow agency as the foundation but having been around for a long time and operating over a long period of history 
what the ultimate agenda is, I don't know, but you could make a good case that it is to enslave the human race because that's where we're headed. When you first started uncovering these things, the specifically the bases, did yeah. you believe it? Did you believe it yourself? Well, I was really... I was amazed at first, George. I was really kind of astonished. Um, when I did the first article for UFO magazine, I, I really had the feeling that I'd uh, exhausted the topic. And it wasn't until I ha had the voice speak to me in the night over the holidays in 1992 and tell me right out of thin air, and I'm not exaggerating here, I heard a voice right out of thin air that spoke in my inner ear that said, as clear as a bell, the underground bases are real. I now understand that the, the alphabet soup agencies have um, brain transmitters, if you will, that permit the transmission of intelligible um, speech to the, directly to the auditory cortex of the human brain. So this is not science fiction. It's not magic. Um, this is nuts and bolts electronic engineering, and decades old, by the way. So... Uh, someone wanted me to inquire into this subject more deeply, and I have and continue to do that. Um, <clears throat> but I was astonished when I started first going into the um, primary documentation, looking in the federal documents, military documents, and going to the engineering literature, uh, looking in the corporate documentation and so forth. Yes. I was amazed at some of what I ran across, and and I, at first, yes, I believed it, but I was at the same time um, you know, almost flabbergasted to to dis discover these things, um, and that persisted maybe for about six months or so until I got the lay of the land a little bit and began to understand there's a lot going on underground, and now I also understand there's a lot going on under sea and we have been so massively lied to it's disappointing it's dismaying that we have people who will presume to be working for us and really they're psychopaths we're talking about pathological lying here george it's disappointing and, and, and i'm sure they've got their ticket when the time comes to be well they do reason. Yeah. they do um if they're on the inside, um, they do have their ticket, and there's a certain amount of of smug one-upness uh, or one-upmanship associated with this, which, by the way, I don't like either. It's kind of like the old movie Eyes Wide Shut, isn't it? Or well, it is, and I, I thought that was a, a very good movie. It was the last movie that Stanley Kubrick made, and there was a great deal of truth in that. Um, he dealt very much with this corrupt, shadowy organization that pulls strings behind the scenes. And if you cross your path, um, you're dead. If you cross their path, if they don't like you, you're just dead meat. If they perceive that you're interfering with their agenda, and they more or less uh, make whatever laws they want, they break whatever laws they want to. Uh, it's their way or the highway, and they're they're here. Stanley Kubrick was saying, "Look, these people are here." They're real, they're ruthless, they're without scruples, they're wealthy, they're powerful, and they're running things from behind the scenes. And they'll do anything they have to do to take advantage of all of us, Richard. They're doing um, it now. Yep. Stay with us, Richard. We're already at the top of the hour. We're going to come back with a final hour with you, and we'll take phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. Okay, in this hour, we're going to take your phone calls now with Richard Sauter. Fascinating research here that he's put into his latest work, Hidden in Plain Sight, and we'll be back in a moment with your calls on Coast to Coast AM. Richard, before we go to calls, what can we do? I mean, we can't go running up to our elected officials and say, we know there's a base there because they won't admit it. What can we do? Well, one of the things we can do is inform ourselves. Uh, for, those, for those who want more information, they could profitably read my books. That's one thing they can do. Another thing, Another thing that I think is the only possible antidote to corrupt government is to withdraw cooperation from it. So I think ultimately uh, we need to begin withdrawing our money and our support from, from this criminally corrupt government 
with the passage of each year, it seems to become more and more of a problem to the country. It's not helping us. Um, it's taking our money, actually stealing our money. It's theft by taking. It's lying to us. So under those condi conditions, I think we're entitled to keep our money for ourselves, pull it out of the big banks, pull it out of the government agencies, stop voting Democrats and Republicans into office, and we really need a National Truth Commission to sort some of these things out. Not only the question of the underground and undersea bases, but the the conduct of the war against Iraq and Afghanistan, of the assassinations stretching all the way back to the 1960s, and especially and including the false flag attacks of um, <clears throat> September 11th, 2001. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole issue all by itself. Which, uh, but it's linked to the others. Well, there's this there's this chain of events that has occurred. It's a probably. rolling, it's a rolling coup d'état that's taken place over a period now of about half a century. And with each new event, whether it's assassination of a president or a presidential candidate or plane slamming into skyscrapers in New York or declaration of a war, war on false pretenses on and on or just outright stealing money from us to our face by the trillions of dollars, this is, this is a um, slow motion coup d'etat intended, and I say it again, to enslave us, to reduce us to nothing. Do, do you believe that there's one of these bases under the Denver airport? Because I'm getting strange stories every once in a while. Well, I'm not clear on that. I, I'm not clear on that. I don't know what's under the De Denver airport beyond uh, normal airport infrastructure like baggage, baggage trains and uh, passenger trains that go out to the concourses, that type of thing. What I can tell you is there, there are multiple levels of very shady and secretive goings on beneath Washington, D.C. I'm much more concerned about what's happening there. Um, and there's good documentation for that. We have been, let's put it this way, what goes on in Washington, D.C. is not at all what we're ta taught in our American civics classes in high school and when we go away to college. And you can't learn that in a book, Richard, can you? You have to learn it the hard way, yeah. and the country is learning it the hard way by having our money stolen from us by people who then lie to us shamelessly and come at the next next election cycle and ask again for our votes. I, I'm simply proposing that we stop voting for them. Here we go. Let's go now to Bev, Dayton, Ohio. First time caller, Bev. You're on Coast to Coast. Hi, George. Hi. Hi, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm kind of taking my life in my hands uh, talking to you about this. Um, I live in a Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And as a little girl, I rode my bike around to the neighborhoods and everything, and I actually saw one of the tunnels being built because they would never think of a child going into an odd area to, you know, to see something like this. So and, they would just uh, let you freely pedal your way in, I guess, huh? Well, actually, no. I kind of pedaled my way in, and then I got pedaled out. <laughs> it's like, go away. Um, I actually um, looked down, and I saw a tremendous tunnel going under a highway very close to the base. And um, during the summertime, when it's quiet and there's no cars on the highway, you can actually hear humming off and on under the highway like a motor, coming and going, like something's traveling under it. And they recently built a hatch in one corner of the base, right out in public view, and it has no purpose there except possibly the entrance. It goes right through where the tunnel was built. Straight down. Now, how far down the tunnel did you get before they escorted you out? <laughs> uh, I didn't actually get down. I actually looked down. They were building it. I was ah. on top of the surface. Okay. And it looked to me like it might have been 50, 60 feet down. What year could that have been, Bev? Uh, it was in the, uh, I would say, late 50s. How's Probably that timeline, Richard? 60s. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, thank you for the story, by the way. Yes, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base has, has been a subject of many uh, stories about underground um, facilities and tunnels, um, and I accept the story the caller tells. 
and and the other stories. Um, a lot of things have gone on at Wright Patterson. I was told that already back in the 60s that the Air Force had two models of UFOs that they flew out of Wright Patterson in the middle of the night. I talked to uh, one of the members of the Project um, Blue Book team, and he told me that um, they would fly them out of there uh, um, during uh, dark nights and uh, during the time of the new moon. They would open the hangar doors and fly the things right out. This is this was uh, UFO type technology. <sighs> the military has technology they haven't told us about, um, and the propulsion that they use, the different types of systems that they use in some cases, uh, it could be of great benefit to society. Uh, it's being held back from us. We've sure. paid for it. It's been developed by people on the public payroll, and it's been kept back from us. In effect, it is the patrimony of the human race. It's actually the intellectual property of the human race, and it's being held back from us. Our military, our government are creating are, are are actually committing great crimes against the American people. Richard C. Hoagland uh, believes that there's a secret space program going on. He well, may be right. right. Yeah. I think he's right. In fact, I suspect there's more than one secret space program going on. That could be, too. Let's go to Cameron, West Jordan, Utah, west of the Rockies. Hey, good morning, Cameron. Hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, first off, uh, I'm a listener, first-time caller. Um, but I, I was, you guys were talking about the underground tunnels and stuff, and I've heard rumors of uh, Denver, Colorado being, like, the new unofficial capital of the United States. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to see also if any of these underground tunnels had to do with, uh, I heard the rumors of the um, Area 51 being transferred to, like, southeastern Utah. And then on an additional note, um, um, the National Truth Commission sounds like a good idea Richard and George, we should start that if it doesn't already exist. I, I like. That. I wonder who would be on that panel, Richard. Who could we believe? Well, I, I could. I could think of some people that would be good to put on it. I'd, I'd put someone like Jim Mars on that panel. Mars. I'd put Ron Paul on it too, even though he's. I wouldn't. I wouldn't because he's too much. Too much a part of the establishment. I would not put him on that panel. You would not. I would put uh, someone like. Catherine Austin Fitz, someone like Cynthia McKinney. Mm -hmm. um, I would put all, oh, um, for starters, those those would be some of the types of people I would put on. I, I'd have to think about some of the others. I would not put Ron Paul on it. He's compromised. What do you think of Area 51? Oh, very serious research and design uh, takes place there. It's a very much a functional active base for for the military industrial espionage complex um, there's certainly uh, large underground facilities there there's a lot of exotic technology that is tested and designed and deployed there as as uh, private as it must be confidential it's probably the most widespread of the facilities underground facilities that are out there well, I'm sure. I'm sure it's one of them. In general, Nevada, the entire state of Nevada, uh, <clears throat> has a lot of underground uh, activity. I would also include New Mexico very much in this conversation, and a facility like White Sands uh, Missile Range, yeah. for example, is, which would be very much um, the same type of facility as Area 51, but receives less attention. But it's also a large, sprawling southwestern facility where the uh, military-industrial espionage complex carries out a lot of cutting-edge uh, R&D. Let's go to Tampa, Florida. Hello, Brenda. It's your turn. Welcome to the show. Hi, George. Hi, Hi. Richard. Hello. Uh, hello. Um, disheartening, but very interesting. Um, I have two questions. All right. Um, McDill Air Force Base is under the water, and um, we have we've heard of um, people sighting planes that just come out of the you know Gulf or the Atlantic. And um, I'm wondering if um, maybe you know it's been connected with the Bermuda Triangle, and um, 
Another question I have for you is, my father fought the other monster, Hitler, as a 19-year-old boy. You know, he went in as a, a you know, officer, and, um, you know, it looks like, you know, we're fighting some other unknown demons, and I'd like to know when maybe this um, unpatriotic America started. Oh, that that the corrupt uh, criminal government has been in the works for a long time. Um, as regards MacDill Air Force Base, my understanding is it is not actually underwater. It's in Tampa, um, and it, it is uh, near the water, but not under the wa water is my understanding. As for objects seen coming in and out of the ocean, yes, this is, has been observed many times over the years by, by numerous witnesses. Um, both in um, on, on shipboard and also uh, from uh, from land. So this is a phenomenon. Are there uh, aircraft, standing. Richard? Are there well, yeah, I think some of them are. I do think some of them are. Others presumably are not. Uh, but yes, this has been observed many times. There's no question that it goes on. The only question is where they're coming from and where they're going to and what they're doing and who's yeah. on them. But yeah. that it happens, there's no question. International Line, we've got Steve in uh, Saskatchewan, Canada. There you go, Stephen. It's your turn. Hey, how are you guys doing tonight? Okay, Good. Steve. Awesome. Uh, I was just wondering if there's any underground bases in Canada. Like, I've heard of a facility, a NATO facility in uh, Thunder Bay, but uh, anything yes, else? Yes, there's one there. There's a there's a sister facility in Thunder Bay to the NORAD facility in, um, uh, underneath Cheyenne Mountain in Col Colorado. However, my understanding is that the uh, NORAD facility at Thunder Bay has been deactivated and is no longer an active military facility. Um, but yes, it, my understanding is there are other more secret facilities elsewhere in Canada underground. So they're all over the place, as you said. Yes, they are. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate your call. Anonymous, Eugene, Oregon. Okay, here we go. Hi there. Hi. This reminds me of a movie I once saw. It's called They Live, where Roddy Rod Piper puts on the glasses and he sees things, how they really are, where the aliens are <laughs> in control. Maybe. You know, aren't you worried about the... Uh, like them taking care of you, that you're exposing all this information to society? Uh, scared of that, actually, Richard? No, no, I'm not worried. At all. All right. Well, that's pretty gutsy. Sometimes. Do you ever look over no, the no, old I shoulder? It, no, it's, it's, not a, it's not a question of having guts. Um, it's simply what I do. I'm expressing my humanity, essentially, and I'm not scared to do that. Um, I think, rather, if I were some of these people... I would, you know, there's, there's certain spiritual realities, and it's possible to so damage your soul that you virtually can't recover from that, and you lose your humanity uh, once and for all. Once you get into mystical literature, you understand um, what harm you can do to your soul if you set out down a dark path intending to do harm to others. And that's what we're faced with here. We're faced with some real nefarious agendas, very dark, very secretive, very powerful, and at their essence, very destructive. And so those who are involved in these programs are really putting their souls at jeopardy. So on the contrary, um, I am not frightened to do what I'm doing. Um, simply what I do is to write and research and talk about what I discover. In fact, it's my right to do that. And it's my human right to do that at a very deep level. And it's the human right of every single person within the sound of my vo voice to take this information in and to act on it in whatever nonviolent way they perceive as appropriate. I would say there are people out there calling for violent retaliation. I'm not one of them. I, am fa in fact, am a firm advocate of radical nonviolence. Um, I, would, I would tend more to be 
um, in the camp of a Mahatma Gandhi or a Dr. Martin Luther King, yeah. for example. Can you imagine, Richard, what they could have done with the money uh, for society instead of using it for these facilities? Quite a lot of good, actually, George. Uh, there's tremendous suffering. And not only to use it for these facilities, but so many trillions of dollars are being lavished on warfare, which is, warfare is a dead end. I mean, it seems like a truism, but th that's the way it is. Um, and yes, this money could be very creatively and productively used in wonderful, constructive ways. Uh, this planet could be a harmonious, peaceful, um, really almost, uh, uh, could be almost a paradise in many ways. But we have very dark beings, not only running the American government, but some other governments on the planet and the large banks and so forth and military institutions, dark beings of very limited, violent, destructive, hateful mentality. And I think the only appropriate way to behave towards them is not violently, but nonviolently, by nonviolently, peacefully withdrawing our cooperation from them personally and from their projects and plans not cooperating with their warfare, and by withdrawing our money and economic uh, um, resources from, frankly, the vast criminal Ponzi scheme that is called the American economy. Don't you think one day people will say enough is enough? Well, that day is already and, starting, George. And they'll that start day is doing beginning. It. It's beginning this year in 2010. I, I think we're we're coming up on that day, and I think a lot of people, by the millions, are simultaneously realizing that, as you say, enough is enough, and we're tired of the psychopaths. I personally am tired of the war. This is just war after war after war. I'm tired of it. Enough. Well, you're not How do you end the wars? By not participating in them. Don't go in the military. It's bogus. What have the people in Afghanistan ever done to us? Why are we even fighting there? What about the Iraqis? They haven't done anything to us. Let's go to Paducah, Kentucky. Zach, it's your turn. Go ahead, Zach. Uh, yeah, George. Man, this is really off the wall, but, uh, you know, I've traveled out to South, South Dakota before, and uh, I've always, you know, I watch the old programs like Cheyenne and uh, Maverick all the time. And, oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, they always talk about, you know, like the Sioux Indians had caverns and caverns of massive amounts of gold, and I was just kind of wondering if maybe – your guest had, uh, and of course, I haven't listened in the first couple hours. I'm really sorry, but if, if possibly the U.S. government at one time had found those caverns well, of gold or the <laughs> city of gold, and you know, well, utilized yeah, that. I don't, I don't think the Sioux Indians ever had caverns of gold. Number one, but there were rumors that when the conquistadors arrived in Mexico, when when Montezuma saw how violent and greedy they were, that there was a um, uh, a, a train of, of of Aztec gold that was brought north into the f Four Corners region of what is now the United States. I don't know if that's true or not, but perhaps something like that did happen. Second we'll be back ago. with final phone calls with Richard Sauter on Coast to Coast AM. Hey, for just pennies a day, you can join Streamlink and get uh, your iPhone apps, podcasting, special archive programs, and also listen to the show whenever you want. Uh, that'll be Streamlink. On our next Coast to Coast program, Graham Hancock joins us, his latest work in Tangled. He, of course, will discuss his research of lost civilizations. That'll be our next Coast to Coast show. When we come back, let's take final phone calls with Richard Sauter right here on Coast to Coast AM. Richard, what can you tell us about the Stanford Research Institute's 1968 report on these uh, manned undersea bases. Yeah, they came out with a report entitled The Feasibility of Manned and Bottom Bases. Uh, they actually uh, were talking about making 30 undersea bases down in the seafloor beneath the uh, bottom of the ocean. And in their scheme, which was somewhat similar to what came out of China Lake, um, they felt like bases could have three three possible functions, industrial, scientific, and military. And by the way, any given one base uh, might simultaneously serve both an industrial, scientific, and a military function. Uh, conceivably, one or more of those could be clandestine. Um, <clears throat> I take that document very seriously. It, again, uh, is um, 
you have to understand that that SRIs, the Stanford Research Institute, is very much like the Rand Corporation, for example, and that it is a think tank that is much used and has been for decades by the military industrial espionage complex uh, to develop new technology and new programs. For example, the um, the U.S. Army's uh, remote viewing Stargate program, which w was run jointly b by Army Intelligence and the CIA, was first developed in prototypical form at SRI back in the 1970s and then was moved to the East Coast and the training was done at the Monroe Institute in Faber, Virginia, up in the mountains. And the actual uh, operational aspect of the program was at Fort Meade um, in, in Laurel, Maryland. So I take that document very seriously, uh, the more so since that, um, since I do have anecdotal accounts of uh, undersea bases uh, from multiple sources and also the documentation from the Navy itself. Okay, back to the phones we go. Norm, Little Rock, Arkansas, first-time caller. Hey, Norm, go ahead. How you doing, fellas? Um, okay. Ben, I have one question. Uh, I'm a first-time caller, like you said, and uh, I'm glad I got through, and I'll, I'll take my answer off the air just because I know other people are wanting to call. My question is, not too long ago, there was a report out of uh, some somewhere about the NASA a lady, like a scientist or whatever for NASA, that come running out of her office, and she was, you know, screaming, the world, has, you know, needs to know. The world needs to know. And so what happened was they ended up, you know, she ended up either, like, just keeling over or something and dying or whatever, but they also, her, her office burned right after that. And I was just wondering if, you know, you think it has to do with that or if you have any knowledge or whatever. But like I said, I'll take my answer off the uh, air. And uh, thank you, guys. And, and another thing is uh, Richard Mann. I'm feeling your pain, and I, I, I'm I'm with you 100 percent on agreement on what's going on, how we're getting rushed, man. Later. Okay. Well, thank you for the comments, caller. I appreciate that. And no, I don't ha have any specific knowledge of the incident that you relate with the um, uh, scientist at NASA. How, however, I would say that 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 I've seen enough uh, with regard to NASA that I know that NASA has covered up quite a bit of information. I do believe that in global form, Richard Hoagland is right. NASA is hiding a lot. I don't know why they are. It's a public agency. They ought to be reporting everything they discover to us and to the scientific community, and they should be doing it openly. However, um, it seems that certain kinds of information have been held back. Um, just more disappointment. What can I say? All right, back to the phones we go. Zeke in Dallas, Texas, east of the Rockies. Go ahead, Zeke. You're on Coast to Coast. Good morning, George. Good morning, Richard. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying long-time listener. Thank uh, you. Tonight's show is absolutely riveting. Um, Richard, uh, one of the few things I've got is you said earlier that there was uh, some secret organization that you really couldn't put a name to. Uh, have you ever looked in the direction of the Bilderberg Group? Yes, I'm familiar with the Bilderbergers, and they do have a name. And there are other groups uh, somewhat similar to the Bilderbergers, like the Council on Foreign Relations, the uh, Trilateral Commission, and so forth. Um, so there are a number of these. Um, there are many um, multilateral organizations uh, uh, that have various plots and schemes for controlling uh, political and economic and military affairs on this planet. Um, what I'm talking about is an organization that ostensibly would be at a higher level and more secretive level even than that. Um, I couldn't say more about it other than to hear, other than to say that I've, I've, I've heard it mentioned. Um, I'm willing to uh, believe that something like that may exist. Okay, Zeke, thanks. Let's go next to Nancy, International Line, London, Ontario, Canada. Go ahead, Nancy. Hi, uh, good, um, good morning. I'm from North Bay, Ontario, and in, uh, during the Cold War, there was a major underground complex built in the Cambrian Shield there, which is very hard rock. I mean, it's one of the oldest in the world. 
And this, this was, uh, missiles were brought in. I remember this as a child. Missiles were brought in <clears throat> and housed there. And it is affiliated with NORAD in Colorado. So when you mention Thunder Bay, I'm wondering if you have the wrong city. Because I've been down into this um, huge complex. It was housed by military, Canadian and American. Yes. And it, it has been um, downsized, but it is still active. I mean, that, active. that's a major yes. engineering. They, they wouldn't close that. <laughs> Well, uh, there may be more than one facility, I, I, and I know they did uh, burrow down down into the um, uh, Precambrian Shield there because that's very hard rock and a very sta stable uh, rock mass. Um, I don't know everything that's been done in Canada. As far as that goes, I don't know nearly everything that's been done in the lower 48. Um, so, yeah, there could be more than one, but when I say Thunder Bay, it's a, it's a large geographic area, no doubt. And um, that it's it was referred that way, it, it referred to in that way in the literature I had available to me. I've never personally visited the place, but I've seen many references to it. Richard, do you get any support from peers or colleagues, anybody like that, who back somewhat up your work? Somewhat, though I'm kind of the odd man out pursuing this line of inquiry, uh, more or less by myself. There aren't many people who do this sort of research and no one who's done it in just the way that I have. So I guess I get a certain amount of moral support, but um, there's really not much exchange of information, if that's what you mean. Years ago, when I first heard of you doing some uh, reports before I even had a chance to interview you, I'm going, oh, this 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 guy may be fun, you know, Jesse James yeah. Caverns and stuff. And, and I went, yeah. oh, no, no, he goes in much deeper than that. It's a deep topic, no doubt. Absolutely. Las Vegas, Nevada. Justin, you're on with us on Coast to Coast. Go ahead, Justin. Hi, guys. Um, I actually have some personal experience with all this. I grew up in Sedona, Arizona, and when I lived there, I started hearing a lot of rumors that there was an underground base near the city, and if you know anything about Sedona, it's a small little town, and there's just wilderness all around it and a bunch of mountains, and I heard these rumors, and it just struck me. I thought, i got to look into this, so I spent 10 years, it seemed, that just the whole time I lived there looking into it, I talked to a lot of people, heard a lot of crazy stories, stuff right out of the X-Files. And I believe there's something there. It's it's just so super hidden and secret. But there were just so many stories of people hiking out there and being accosted by military guys and hearing rumbling and humming noises underground and seeing trucks and military trucks going into the wilderness and disappearing where there's no military base. There's nothing around there. There is a military base about 30 miles north, but that's it. And when I lived out there, I heard the noises myself. I heard the hum that it's like it's as if there were semis going up a steep hill, and it's underground, if you could imagine that. And it's out in the middle of nowhere, and there's just nothing there. There's no machinery, no buildings, nothing. So I heard it myself. And I believe my phones were tapped when I was looking into this. I mean, I'd talk to my friends about this on the phone at night, and we'd just hear these clicking noises. And we had landlines at the time. And you'd just hear these little clicking noises and just weird static on the phone. I've never heard it before or since. And I just saw so, just so many weird stories and crazy stuff. And I think it's different from the idea of Mount Weather and Cheyenne Mountain, and these places we know about, Area 51, we know about these places. If they're kind of half underground, half on the surface. This thing is totally super hidden. It's super secret. I believe it's there. And I know where it is, general idea, but it's just totally underground. And I think it's connected maybe to the, the base 30 miles north or it's connected some way, but it's there. But it's just so super secret. And I think there's a difference. There's the Cheyenne Mountain stuff. And then there's these other bases out there that are just out of this world, super technology and i think people uh, and maybe they go out and they take a hike and they see something weird and they don't know what it is yeah. but if you start connecting these little stories and you hear the same stories different people they'll be out there and they heard they saw these little silver balls that would float around and that sounds crazy but i've heard other stories of people who've seen these in other places and they're like little surveillance devices and they float around out there and they they're watching i mean it's just crazy stuff but when you hear enough stories and they all kind of line up it's something to think about. So I just want to ask you about that. Maybe you've heard of it. Well, sure. In fact, um, I used to live up at Flagstaff, uh, and I've I've done some hiking around the Sedona area myself. Um, 
There's no doubt that some of these underground facilities have exotic technology um, and that so much information has been held back from us. There's no question my research reveals unambiguously that there are secret underground bases created by the American military. There's just no doubt of that. And my research also shows unambiguously that these bases can be very deep, a mile deep, and even even much deeper than that. Um, they can be accessed by uh, vertical high-speed elevator shafts, uh, by horizontal, horizontal shafts that go into the sides of cliffs and mountains. The entrances and exits and air shafts for these facilities can be and are camouflaged. Um, so... I certainly have heard many stories about the Sedona area along the lines of what you've, you've just related to us. So, so I, I'm keeping an open mind about Sedona and, and the surrounding area, and I don't rule out at all that there could be one or more super-secret underground facilities in that region. I bet we'd be in awe, Richard, if we saw one of these facilities. Uh, well, you know, from what, I, from what people have described, who've been in them, and from what I've seen in my archival and, and documentary research, we're, we're dealing virtually with a s parallel universe, a, a type of science fiction reality. And I say again, we have been so lied to, just massively lied to. There's, it, it's, it's, it's pathological. Um, we have been Betrayed. I, I would use that word. We have been betrayed. There's, there's a, at a very basic level, there's a type of treason here. We have been sold out. And um, the picture that's coming into focus for me is real ugly. This is no small thing. It's not like a personal indiscretion or something like that. This is a massive, a massive crime against society from the highest and deepest levels of the military-industrial espionage complex and from the highest and most powerful levels of the American government, the corporate structure and the American government. They have used us, they have lied to us, and they have betrayed us and sold us out. It's and, world, and worldwide, though, Richard. So. Well, worldwide, but it's centered here in the United States. Like it or not, this is the most powerful system on the planet at this point in our history. So it really centers here. Um, it may go on in other areas, of other regions of the world, but here in North America, there's a, re a real nexus of these shenanigans. And I, I wouldn't let the American government off the hook. They have done us wrong. Rymersburg, Pennsylvania. Hello, David. Let's try to get you in and maybe one or two more callers. Good go morning, ahead. George and uh, Richard. I have great information. If you'd like to call me back later, I can give you even more documented evidence and things that are going on here uh, that has been the called the Iron Mountain. It was the first uh, of the ones built underground, I believe, from what we can see linking uh, areas of Washington, D.C., New York City, going to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and out west. Uh, this was done. Where are you located? Uh, Rymersburg, Pennsylvania, but this area, USIS Iron Mountain, is a city underground. Over 6,000 people work there each shift uh, throughout the day and night and evening. And then uh, they have... What town is that in? Uh, it's in northern Butler County. It goes the whole county over. Goes has a... Uh, a, 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 a uh, Air Force has a base where for an airport has a mountain uh, that has range with the railroads going through it. They have two plants that they've uh, started this was commercial shearing in Youngstown, Ohio, where they got the steel, and in uh, in Gary, Indiana, and then also in Pittsburgh. And uh, they have their own steel plant now, right in the middle of a rural area that they supply their steel. And they um, they started all this engineering here through commercial sharing. And then they have buses that bus these people inside there uh, from a, a busing called Campbell Busing. They have a hand scan they have to go through and a face scan. Um, I went what are through they there. Doing there? Down there, doing? it's over a mile and a half deep. It's like a city. It goes all the way along, and they have uh, they 
they say they store uh, every book that, or tape or record or film that has ever been done, and they have all the criminal records stored there, and they also have enough room there for over 800 people to supply over eight years underground, and it's the president's cabinet and it's their families, and they have uh, the airport there is accessible. They have it because it's the gateway of the Alleghenies. They, yeah. The largest locomotive capital of a uh, factory in General Electric has in Grove City. It's nationwide. They sell to the Arabs and everything. Well, anyhow, uh, they work with Magnetics, and they have – it's another company uh, supplying high-speed rail underground. And then uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University. Why don't you write an article uh, engineers. Like that? Why don't you write an ar article about everything you know and post it to the Internet? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's huge. And we'll get your number, too, David, and we'll follow up with you. Um, but you know what? It, it's continuing cooperation for what you've been saying, Richard. Yes. Um, I, I expect that there's a lot of this going on, and I, um, I would like to know more information about that. It would be wonderful to interview that guy or... I, 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 I encourage him to write an article and post it widely to the Internet. We need – people know, know information all over the country, and those who have information need to come forth with it. We need thousands of whistleblowers. Let's air this out. Um, if these facilities exist, and they do, uh, uh, we're entitled to know about it. We should know about it. And if the government won't tell us, that, then let's please – Tell each other if they we, want. We own it, right? We, <laughs> we should pay, tell each we other. We paid for them. Exactly, and we should tell each other what we know. And shame on the government for lying to us and stealing Rich, from us. Richard, hidden in uh, plain sight, available at the bookstores right now? Yeah, well, it's it's at Amazon.com and at KeyholePublishing.com. Okay, Those great. are the two sources at present. Super. Thanks, Richard. Richard Sauter. For Dan Galanti, David Benjensky. Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDesour, Ross Mitchell, George Nappy and Punnett and Art Bell. I'm George Norrie. Somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.